responsible AI. I am a, I'm also joined by my colleague Raji. Uh, both me and Raji would be very happy to take your questions as we go through this particular content. Please stop us wherever you have questions. This is mostly about you asking, you know, any apprehensions you have around AI, right? So you, you can just go ahead and ask us. We'll try our best to answer, right? So as you must have all seen uh, that we are going to talk about responsible AI today. And um, uh, I want to start beginning uh, this particular discussion asking about all of us that uh, we none of us in this room deny that there is a profound impact of AI in our life, right? Right from having uh, the uh, Alexa telling us about the weather, right, to uh, having an automated car driving us. So we are seeing AI in our life every day, right? And um, it's no more a science fiction, right? So we're in... Uh, Currently, if you have seen the COVID vaccine, so that was possible because of uh, the, the pace at which it came was because of AI, right? A uh, lot of drug discovery happening in healthcare industry. We are also seeing emergence of automated vehicles, right? So wherein uh, self-driving cars have hit the roads. There are self-driving trucks that are coming up, right? So we are actually seeing them happening as we speak, right? And... Um, very recently, last uh, year, right? So you are you are actually uh, impressed by the chatbots which are now enabled with AI, wherein long call hours are reduced to what shorter five to one minute, right? So wherein the chatbots assisted by AI are able to answer with a similar response as a human chatbot would do it, right? So a lot of us are seeing this in action and we are also amazed by how AI is helping us with the content creation, right? With respect to videos, audios, composing a music, writing a literature. So there is a list that goes and on and on. And actually creativity is something which has really amazed all of us with respect to the AI, right? And uh, last but not the least, uh, we are also um, helped by AI in optimizing um, our energy consumption, which directly aids in our climate change, uh, you know, uh, research, right? So a lot of work happening in that area as well, right? Now, we have uh, AI helping us in our life, infused in our life so much, uh, but at the same time, we are also seeing everyone talking about AI incidents, incidents now, right? So AI existed more or less 15 years back, but you still see uh, this has changed, but what has changed now, right? Uh, if you see that it has increased by 2000% uh, in recent years, right? So since 2022, the number of incidents related to AI have shooted up, right? So this actually brought, brings us, right? So to the discussion that is uh, um, the topic of today's session. Right. So if you see um, Gemini is the uh, model which is released by Google, it actually has to pass uh, because of its anti work backlash. Right. And then we also heard about Samsung workers leaking out the trade secrets via the chat GPT. Um, the iTutor is one of the companies that does the tutoring to the remote students in China. So wherein um, it was known that the, the recruitment algorithm actually rejected uh, the applicants based on the age, right? So like that, you see a lot of uh, incidents happening and it's ever increasing, right? Now, it's very, very imperative now to actually embrace AI, which uh, we are doing it. But at the same time, we have to do it in a sustainable manner so that it harmonizes our core values, right? And the human values and infuses or coexist in a social fabric, right? So this is what we want to discuss today, right? So responsible AI is where we want to begin, right? So you might have heard uh, different terms. Um, you could have heard trustworthy AI, values-driven AI, digital humanism, ethical AI, AI for good. So these all mean um, how can we develop or adopt and maintain an AI system so that it has a positive impact on the society, 
right? So this is what uh, a responsible AI in a nutshell means, right? And the responsible AI is driven by some core principles, right? So the any responsible AI system has to be fair, which means that irrespective of a gender, ethnicity, right? The AI system has to treat everybody equally, right? So that is what the fairness part is of the responsible AI core principles, right? And then there it has to be reliable and safety. Um, it has to have privacy, right? So, and explainability, right? It has to have a capacity or the ability to explain why it has arrived at cert certain decision. Right? Now, if I take these core principles uh, in responsible AI and apply it to the examples in education, right? So if I have a system called personalized learning, right, in education, wherein it will tailor all your educational content uh, specific to a student needs, right? And it will also fine tune the pace to the need or to the pace of a student. Now, if at all it is a uh, if the, it has a responsible AI component, the personalized learning system will ensure that there is a fairness and avoid a lot of reliance on AI, right? Which means that it will not be biased to a certain gender of the student or the ethnicity of a student, but irrespective of that, it will take the um, capability or the talent of the student, right? And then accordingly tailor the content. Right. So if if I take another example with respect to intelligent tutoring system, right? So which is an interactive guidance support given to the students, right? But if I have uh, the responsible AI component within this particular system, right? So it'll allow in human intervention in this particular tutoring system. So with the responsible AI core systems, we can build AI systems, right? So that actually aligns with our human values, right? So now, having seen this, right, so we need to see that how we can balance out the innovation, the regulation, and the innovation. Now, if I see that if I have to use AI, I have to facilitate um, personalized content review, right? But at the same time, there will be regulation that will protect the human rights, right? But if I tighten the regulations further, the innovation succeeds, right? So how do I do that balancing act so that the regulations still exist, so that I facilitate um, the, the positivity, right, that the AI systems gonna bring, right? So this is where responsible AI will bring in those core principles, those guardrails which are needed for the fine balance to achieve this particular ethical innovation is what we call, right? Now, uh, now we understand that the, the AI systems are there, right? And what are the core principles of responsible AI, which means that if AI systems are responsible, what are the core features it should have, right? Now, how important is the human element for the whole AI system? So that is what we will try seeing here. Now, this is a simple example that I have taken, right? So wherein I ask the AI system to generate a picture of a salmon swimming in water, right? And if you see, this is what you expect, that you want a salmon fish swimming in a water. But what you're actually gonna get is these set of images, right? But as we speak, the models are really improving at a pace faster than this, but this actually brings in the aspect that without a human element, the AI systems are a little shaky, right? Now, we have seen the different, uh, uh, resources, right? For example, the web, mobile, digital, cloud, and AI. So these are all amplifying the human potentials, right? Now, there are task uh, elements that these allow us to perform, right? But I have listed out, right, what needs to be handled by machine and what needs to be handled by humans, right? So for example, if I take driving car as an example task, now driving a car can be done by machine, but humans have to define the safety. So applying brakes can be handled by machine, but defining the traffic rules needs to be done by humans. So if I take it further and apply it to the context of an education, you would also see that yes, web, mobile, digital have enabled uh, the potential of students, educator and administrative officers, right, of, at the schools. And uh, if I have to list some of the tasks that the machines can handle, right? So for example, 
delivering educational content, be creation of a video, creation of a content, right? So that can be very well done by AI now, but designing a learning experience has to be done by human, right? So we also have models, right? Where in, in your classroom as soon as the student enters, so this particular model identifies, recognizes the student, automatically marks the attendance. So this system can be, can, can be done by an AI, but building an inclusive class environment is the responsibility or needs to be handled by human. So the human and AI has to go hand in hand, right? So wherein we have to see what we want these AI system to deliver, right? So that our potential, our um, skills, right, are augmented or are amplified by AI systems, right? Now, we emphasized that AI systems uh, have to be responsible. There has to be a human element and maybe the AI system at the same time, the security of these AI system is also very, very important, right? So I want to take a few examples with respect to what is happening in the world today, right? So here, if you see, it's a simple example of an image, right? Which um, identifies the people or a person in the given image. Now with a simple adversarial image, right? Which means that this image is slightly modified by a, a human, right? In a way that it becomes very difficult for a human eye to identify what's the difference between these two images. A normal human eye finds it very difficult to identify the image, the changes in the image, but for a model, it confuses and it does all sort of predictions, right? A slight change in an image can make the model prediction go haywire. Right, so here in this example, if you see a school bus with little noise added, right, can be made to be identified as an ostrich by the AI systems, right? So a stop signal, again, by just adding four blocks, we can make this to be recognized as a speed limit of a 45 by an AI system, right? So these are some of the attacks that are happening that are possible, right? And you also have intruders right getting past the security camera again by using certain set of for example this normal without any block right will be identified by the ai as a person but with a small signage here right so this person will be allowed right so so this sort of uh, security attacks are happening and we need to have some security mechanisms for the ai systems as well right so now Guarding the principles, right, for our AI systems, we have to ensure that there has to be fairness, bias, privacy, security, safety, and explainability. These form the core pillars. But at the same time, we have to codify these core principles in the form of a guardrails. And we see that there are three different guardrails that would be needed, right? So you have to have a legal guardrails, which means that there has to be regulatory compliance, Right? So for, for my state, these are my compliance requirements. So this needs to be codified in the AI system. right? So the, there has to be AI governance. Who will take a decision of approving the AI system? right? So who will design that? Uh, what action needs to be taken when an AI system fails to act? right? So all this comes under AI governance. right? So somebody has to write those process and they have to be codified into the AI system. And then there are technical guardrails, which means that the, with the way AI systems are designed, right, technically they are all met by the core principles that responsible AI system stands for, right? So there are core principles which needs to be codified in the form of guardrails, right? The guardrails can be legal guardrail, a process guardrail, or a technical guardrail, right? But all three are the facets that will make the whole system complete, right? Now, if if an AI system comes into your education system, so the first thing you have to question is, is it a responsible, right, AI, right? So does, does it have all the responsible AI components, right? So for example, is it fair? Is it biased, right? Does it have privacy, right? So when my student is taking a test, right? So it, it of course, it has to help the student to automatically get the feedback, but at the same time, is the privacy of my student also protected, right? Are the AI systems secure enough that they're not attacked by the external system, right? The AI system are safe enough to be used that they don't pose any threat to the users of the system, 
And when it gets the results, does it explain why it has arrived at that particular result? So that's what the explainability part is. So you have to question that, is it fair? Does it have privacy? Does, is it secure? Does it provide safety controls and explainability? Is it codified? Right. So you have to also ask what are the guardrails, right? So what are the processes in place? What are the governance mechanism and what are the technological capability that is codified into the system? Right. So these are the questions that you have to ask before you actually start adopting an AI system. Right. So now we saw all of this, right? So the key principles are seven key principles that you have to uh, keep in mind, right? Human and AI have to go together, right? So I told you what AI can do, right? And But at the same time, humans have to be the uh, torchbearer, right? So wherein they define what uh, the expectation is from the AI system, right? So humans and AI have to go together. The AI is there to augment the human potential, not to replace the human, right? So that's the core principle on which we have to stand the AI system. Right, transparency wherein it has to be very accountable. Explain why it has done what it has done. Right, so the results need to be explainable. If it has rejected a certain candidate from a selection process, it has to list out, explain why it was rejected. Right, so such explainable capabilities are built into the AI system. Right, of course, human rights needs to be safeguarded. Right, the fundamental human rights will be ensured, and there is safety for all the users of the system inclusive and equal access right irrespective of gender ethnicity it should be it should be um, accessible to everybody right and um, i also want to bring up one, one more point here right so development of an ai system should not be only restricted to the ai developers ai architects right so it has to be inclusive because everybody has to have a say in the development of ai uh, systems, right? So which which means that you also have to bring in your uh, opinion to the table as we build the AI system. So democratization is one of the key uh, requirement for building that perfect AI system, which caters to the human values, right? So everybody, irrespective of whether they are technically with a, with a technical background, non-technical background, everybody has to have a say and how do I want this particular AI system helping my organization, right? So ethical innovation, I, I spoke about it, right? So there has to be uh, regulations, right? To, but it should not impede the innovation. So there has to be a perfect balance. How do I lever or tune the regulation so that you know my innovation keeps on growing in my favor, but not actually and not, uh, not uh, reducing the innovation, right? And then uh, it cannot be only one system or a one uh, uh, organization that has to actually uh, be or held responsible for the AI adoption. It has to be done across the organization. If it is across um, the education system, all the education system have to incorporate the common principles, right? The adoption needs to be done at the global level, but not at a, a singular level, right? and uh, fairness with respect to age, gender, income level, right, ethnicity. So these are some of the things which um, these must seven principles, right, needs to be understood for the responsible by design, right? Uh, with this, I just want to take a pause, right, and throw this fundamental philosophical question to everyone, right? So this is a common uh, problem, which is known as a trolley problem in the technology world, right? So wherein in the first figure, you see that um, there are two lanes, right? And the automated uh, car is passing through. So there is a group of people who are health workers jaywalking the signal, which is uh, which says stop. And then there is um, a kid, right? A dog and a man, right? So just um, crossing the road when it's a signal is green, right? So what would be the right... Um, you know, decision for this particular vehicle, right? Whether it should take a straight turn, killing the five health workers, or should it just uh, take a turn, right? And take this path, right? What would you do as a human? I just open the floor for the question and the discussion. And uh, let me know if you want me to repeat some of the questions, right? So, but here we'll take a pause and, you know, take some questions. 
I would like to hear uh, your thoughts on what what would be the right way to do here, right? So if if humans were to uh, encounter such a problem, any thoughts? Okay, I see somebody saying the dogs. Any other thoughts? Shifting a vehicle into a manual. Health workers as adults are likely to react faster and think faster. Yes, beautiful thoughts. Go ahead. I'm sure if you encounter such a problem, your mind works in different ways, right? So just gain all the thoughts that you have right? And then we will realize uh, what it means to build a responsible AI systems, right? I believe that an aware human would have started slowing down ahead of time to avoid having to make the hard choice. Turn car off and head for a wall instead of pedestrians, right? Which means that the machine learning model, which is actually controlling the car, needs to be fed with these decision-making capability, right? So wherein if it sees a threat to a life, it has to turn off a car or head for a wall instead of the pedestrians, right? So, so it's such a difficult question, right? So this is uh, what you understand, what um, gets, uh, needs to get into a model, right? So the model is not uh, provided with adequate training data if it has not seen adequate uh, examples, right? So you will end up building a disastrous AI system, right? So this is what uh, I want to stop with, right? So any questions, uh, I think let's, let's take questions. Feel free to unmute yourself, right? Um, I want uh, you to come up, ask me, what does it mean, right? So what are your apprehensions? What are you seeing, right? And then I'll um, hand it over to James, but I think uh, we we want to hear the questions. Any questions? Raji, do you want to add anything um, so that it triggers some questions to all the participants? Sure. Yeah, I think uh, Mika, you've covered it, and um, one thing I want to point out. Uh, point out to the student community, the teachers community here is, uh, this is more a corporate view of things. Uh, so we still thought, you know, it's a complementing view, but we would present. Uh, today, as we are building these enterprise systems, we are, you know, one part is the technology, which seems to be the easier part, but when it comes to the judgment of how machines take and the level of autonomy we need to give the way the humans are paired with a machine. It's not an easy choice. And we are realizing more and more, this is just not a problem of computer science, but we need to have a multidisciplinary team in place in order to be able to look at it from multiple different perspectives um, so that whatever systems we are building is aligned with human values at the same time doesn't carry the biases uh, which humans have because we are feeding these systems with a lot of data which human biases uh, are included in them. So it's a very complex uh, area for just uh, thinking from an engineering standpoint. It's a lot more than that. And uh, that's one thing which we believe the education of tomorrow needs to incorporate this holistic thinking uh, in multiple dimensions rather than just teaching computer science the way we have taught it, you know. So that's the only thing I would like to add, Megha, and uh, I will wait for any of the questions which the audience may have. Yeah, so James has shared um, Teach AI um, resources, right? So this is what I have also listed out uh, here, right? So there is an AI guidance toolkit that is very 
well developed by Teach AI, right? So it gives you a lot of good resources. How do I get the AI systems into my school, right? So should I um, allow students to actually use chat GPT? Now, what will change if I allow them to use chat GPT, right? So for example, a lot of uh, teachers are concerned that how do I actually evaluate? How do I avoid the plagiarism, right? So a lot of content is now coming up from a chat GPT. Now, how do I actually do an evaluation? So this is where I think we all have to brainstorm because the whole education system is now disturbed, right? So it's disrupted rather. So the evaluation techniques has to be different now. Now, what do you evaluate on? For example, earlier we used to evaluate based on a content or a final results, right? But now it, it lays more emphasis on what is what was the process used for arriving at that particular result, right? So what were the references that the student has used? So instead of just focusing on the final output, which we earlier used to do, I think now it is more than imperative that we have to go through our evaluation process, right? Or read, rethink about how do we evaluate this particular submission by a student, right? Because now chat GPT is there for augmenting them. And uh, cutting off, right, the access to these systems is not at all a solution that we have all learned now, right? Because if it's cut off in the school, school systems, they still have an access to these systems in their personal uh, laptops or the devices, right? So which cannot be really regulated. So I think adopting, embracing, but also rethinking the way we do our task, uh, I think is more needed than actually cutting it off, right? So I just want to hear your thoughts. What are some problems that you're facing, right? So are you seeing your students uh, using um, these AI systems? Um, what are some of the problems, right? So anything, any thoughts, um, if, if you are if you are free, right, please uh, put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask the questions. Right? So what works for one of the one of the state may not be relevant for the other, which means that these AI system have to be fine-tuned for the other uh, requirements, right? So from school to school, from region to region, right? It has to be uh, customized, right? It has to have all those policies ingrained, right? Based on the region. So these are all the capabilities that the AI system have to bring in. I think you will have to question as soon as there is an AI system, right? So these are some of the things, hey, my, my region, right? Requires that these have to be adhered in the process, right? These are my requirements. Does the AI system cater to that? You'll have to test as an educator. I think it's, it's, um, it's it's a, it's honest on uh, educator right to actually test these AI systems, ensure that these are all transparent, fair, not biased, safe enough for the kids right to use them, uh, which means that we have to educate ourselves more right and understand what are the benefits that these are bringing, and then understand the negatives of it, and also fine tune our evaluation accordingly, right. So I have a question. So do so do each system create closed AI systems? Are they as good as information is limited? Um, it's it's hard to answer whether we have to create a closed AI system, right? Like I said, for an organization, it is possible. So today, uh, if you see a chat GPT, so the other version which is specifically created for the students, is by the Khan Academy which is called as Kamingo app, right? So the way this particular Kamingo app is designed, I would encourage all teachers, right? All educators to try out this particular app. So it is designed in a different way wherein it will not arrive at the answer, right? As soon as the kid types, right? Saying that, hey, um, give me the answer for this particular middle school, right? It starts writing the answer and it gives the response if you type it in the chat GPT. Whereas if you use Kamingo app, right? <clears throat> Rather than arriving at the solution, it makes sure that it creates that critical thinking in the student where it gives the nudges to the student, right? Hey, think in this particular direction. These are the steps you have to follow, right? So that it makes sure that the student has learned the concept, but not got the response as is, 
right? So such apps are being developed considering what is beneficial for students. So we have to encourage the right set of tools, right, for the students instead of letting them go with the open systems, which will not be beneficial for them. Nika, there's <clears throat> another question by Sophie on uh, the, you know, paid version of services uh, versus so, okay. so one of the things I would like to add is, you know, yeah. chat GPT is just one of those AI services today. A lot of democratization is happening in the industry, which means that you are going to get free models. When I say free, it's not freemium, but actually models which you can use. Uh, Meta, for instance, has released a very big, powerful model, which you don't need to pay any money to use. In that sense, it brings about equity because it's just not people who have access or need to pay some 20 bucks a month to use. But a lot of these models in the future are going to be open sourced. And that's pretty much something you need to uh, keep in mind about. And similarly, um, you know, one may wonder if these models when, you know, can sometimes be hosted locally. And these models are also shrinking in size without losing their efficacy, which means you can have powerful models which you can set up on your machine um, and still run them. So we will see an increased uh, democratization of these models wherein uh, the equity part, right, that it's available to all um, uh, is going to be uh, coming very soon. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to, thanks Raji. Um, so I'm going to read Michelle's uh, question. So uh, this is with respect to AI hallucination. And uh, this is very, very important. And this is where AI education comes into picture, right? So you have to have an education imparted to the students telling that uh, these models are not right all the time, right? And there is a inherent characteristic called hallucination, which means that the model output may not be correct all the time, right? So that is also part of your education. So when you impart, right, telling them, okay, these are the right AI tools which are required for your school education. Now you also need to be aware that these, this is what uh, the output, right? You have to evaluate the output. These are not correct, right? So there is a good amount of um, um, you know research that has to go in to understand the output right and consume the output right so that also has to be part of your education so the teach ai link which james has shared right so it includes the uh, some of the guidance as in what educators can teach the students with respect to adopting the ai systems for their curriculum right what are some of the things that the kids need to know when they are using the AI system, right? So AI hallucination is one of the uh, uh, required, right, guidance that the educators have to give to the kids, right, to use the AI systems. Yeah, I and hope just to add, add yeah. to what Megha has done in the toolkit, we have also tried to classify two kinds of usage. Some of us as consumers of AI, right? So when we consume these large language models, what do we need to be aware of, right? That's one part of it. The second perspective is we as builders of AI or students who are taught to build AI, how should they build these AI systems responsibility? So I think we have these two different perspectives and based on whether you're a consumer of AI or a builder of AI, the kind of skill sets the students will need would be uh, different. And I think this Teach AI toolkit sort of alludes to that um, uh, differences. Uh, Megha, there's another favorite question of ours, which is related to the energy sources needed to run AI. Maybe mm -hmm. I will take this. Megha pointed out the aspect wherein AI can be used to solve the world's uh, sustainability issue. So, for example, I would give you a very good use case in the industry we have done. There's something called as carbon sequestration, which is a very important procedure in the energy industry uh, especially in oil and gas, to make sure that the carbon emissions are minimized. So they say there's not enough soil in this earth 
to be able to conduct the number of experiments you would need to know how to optimally do the CCUS. So these gigantic machines can actually be used to speed up the discovery. This discovery could be, as Mega said, in the areas of sustainability, or it could be, for example, in drug discovery. I know of cases wherein uh, one of the prestigious clinic used um, uh, this kind of generative AI technology to find the specific gene expression in, uh, to detect the triple negative breast cancer. So AI can be used uh, as a use case, but at the same time, we should not forget these large language models need a lot of machines and hence energy usage. GPT 3.5, I believe, uh, took about 285,000 CPUs and 11,000 GPUs, and the power uh, required for about, I think, 300 days or so. So you can imagine that today, when Megha and I started, we were at just one model to have. Today, we have 700,000 models. Everybody is making a model. NVIDIA stock is going up. All of you know that. But I'm just trying to say that the compute and the hardware is enormous. Uh, that's definitely one perspective. But the other perspective is building models which are purposeful, which can solve good problems is another dimension. Thanks, Raji. Uh, very interesting question. I think all of us can brainstorm here, right? So Mia says... Uh, at this point, it feels like kids are teaching the adults as they're more willing to adopt AI, right? So uh, this takes me back to Google search uh, way back in 2001, right? So then back then, teachers were the one who knew everything, right? So teachers were the source of information, the knowledge bank, right? Which means that every question, um, the answer is available with the teacher, right? But when Google search came in, um, that totally... Uh, disrupted what the definition of a teacher was, right? Because Google search was way smarter, right? So had it everything at the fingertips, was responding, right? But did it change anything with respect to education? Now, I think we, we fine-tuned adopting that, hey, I need not know everything, but there is my role, which is very, very specific, unique, irrespective of what Google search does, right? So as the educator, I think we always had uh, evo evolution, right, in a way that technology has come in, right, making us more and more uh, catering to the needs, which is more valuable, right, which is, which I believe is imparting that human values, right, creating that experience, right, with the students, right, and letting them know that what they need to pursue. So these are some of the things which I think AI can never replace. Now with AI coming in and students adapting to the AI, right? It becomes more important, like I was telling. So you cannot really now evaluate based on what the output is produced by the student, but rather if you change it, right? To, to think about critically asking, what was the process being used by the student to arrive at that particular answer, right? What resource did the student use? Was there any citation for the resources that was used? So these become more important in the evaluation process than ever, right? A anything you want to add, Raji, with respect yes. to? I would like to definitely add on this point because I have been in this industry for 30 years. When I started, I started as a mainframe programmer. And today I code in AI, but I can tell you that the kind of grill we have gone through in terms of thinking from multiple perspectives, right? Today, I know some of the team members in my team can code faster than me, but I also know that AI has taken computer science, especially software engineering to the next level where you need to be very expressive with your language. Some of my best programmers today are not software engineers, but people who can have very strong linguistic background, who have a good perspective, who can write good English to get the kind of effect one needs to. So I do agree that, you know, students seem to be catching better on Discord and a lot of social media and cool things. But I think we are still very much relevant because we bring in those kinds of perspectives, which is just not about knowing the tech, but, you know, holistically thinking about system as a whole, borrowing certain principles from other interdisciplinary areas, be it neuroscience or how we, we learn language and other areas. So yes, Mika, over to you. 
Yeah. So next interesting technology question with respect to language uh, to code in AI, right? So this is a very tricky question for us because uh, English has become a new programming language, right? So prompting is taken uh, a, so much of a disruption for us that we all, we, we all programmers, right? Started thinking that do we even need programming, right? But still uh, there are critical applications that are still in the world, right? So we cannot just let AI do the job uh, wherein we still need people who needs to program. Right, so a lot of the development in AI is happening in different languages, Python being one of the prominent language that is being used. And then you have um, uh, R, which is coming up, right? Uh, we also have, uh, what was that, Raji? The language recently starting with Rust. letter G. Um, in Rust. Rust. Yeah, and I think, then... yeah, I think English is the best language, according to me, if you have like, <laughs> Or anthropic for for me, for example, as I said, I'm an engineer in computer science, but over the 30 years I've programmed in many different things. Today, if I forget a syntax of a language, I don't care much, right? There is a co-pilot which I use, which auto-completes what I do. So things are pretty much uh, easy um, to use. And uh, yeah. Sophie is asking another very interesting question. Um, on yeah. what is the best free AI system. Uh, so Sophie, you must go to this beautiful hug uh, hub called as Hugging Face. You know, the way you hug your face, Hugging Face. Um, that hub has some really cool models. So Megha was talking about creation of images. So you can go and look at something called as Stable Diffusion. If you want, uh, you know, language related, you have a lot of these models. Uh, there is a leaderboard which actually shows which of these models is leading because as I said, it's not one model, two model, but 700,000 models, different sizes. Some of them speak 55 languages. So it just depends on what you need. Uh, and this is also um, hugging face is H-U-G-G-I-N-G -G -G face. Maybe Megha, you can, you can type that yeah, out. I have put that, yeah. And also, I think um, uh, GitHub Copilot um, is uh, the assistant, code assistance for the computer science educators, right? So you all have open source ID called Visual Studio Code and GitHub Copilot comes for free to the educators. So all you need is register with your educational institution ID and that particular co-pilot is for free for the educators as well as for students. So encourage your students to use that particular co-pilot, which is a coding assistant, wherein you give a prompt in English and it generates the code for you, right? Uh, it just assists you in coding, right? Improving your code or generating a code, right? Learning your coding skills more, but it's no way meant to replace the coding, right? So I think all we have to agree on this one that there is there is no AI system for the replacement. It is only for augmenting uh, human intelligence, right? So GitHub Copilot is uh, one best tool for all the computer science uh, students and educators. Yeah. So register, I think um, uh, it's it's free for educators. So you should be able to access it, right? So I think we'll also find some of the resources that are free for the educators and we'll share that uh, uh, in the slides. I think we will put those links in the slides. Any other questions? Anything of concern? Anything of concern? Anything which you always uh, worried that how is this happening or what is happening, right? Or any questions as in what you need to learn, what you need to know, what's coming up? How reliable are AI checkers? Um, I didn't quite get what checkers mean. Maybe I can take that. Um, yeah. So a lot of times AI are all, they say, right? Stochastic parrots, they say, right? So it's all probability and probability. So the question is, if you coming out, you ask a question and gives you an answer. 
how the hell do you even know whether this answers are right or wrong? It could be plagiarism. It could be, you know, you're trying to retrieve some question. What is the confidence? So today, that's the biggest challenge. So we have certain ground truth evaluations or benchmarks which humans have created for different tasks, right? For example, math questions, science questions, general knowledge. So these evaluation benchmarks are run on all of these large language models. That's one part of it. But but specifically with respect to plagiarism, something very interesting has come up, which is, you know, large language models themselves as judges, which means if you use an LLM to produce a text, you can use the same LLM to critique it, right? When I say critique it, you can find um, uh, whether these, uh, you know, you want to ask a question, you know, is this plagiarized? Or you can ask it specific, critique this piece of work and tell me what are the flaws. So LLMs as judges is a very evolving area. Not all LLMs are good evaluators, right? Um, uh, to know the difference between good and bad, they need to be able to grade them. They need to be able to give the supporting evidence. So GPT 3.5 is supposed to be, and 3.4 is supposed to be very good evaluators, whereas certain other evaluators from Cohere, for instance, is another large language model, cannot differentiate between a good answer and a really good answer. So I think this is a very important area, and we are seeing the same large language model uh, can be used either using the uh, ground truth evaluation by humans or can have others, other large language models to do the evaluation. So Ron says, last year, my APCS students asked if they could start using AI for their FRQ responses. Uh, my response was certainly as soon as College Broad allows me as a reader to also use AI to grade your responses and your all way rights to contest the grades produced. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> so I know it, it's been a challenging year for all of us, right? So... Thank God I'm not a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God I sometimes think I will retire before this becomes a big issue and nobody has any answers. Yeah. But I, I believe that we will all uh, go through this evolution together, right? So there is ray of hope because we'll all, we have to all come together to make these AI systems as responsible AI systems, right? So I think we have, uh, we have to ensure that they are in place. So with that, probably um, it'll it'll be um, enabler for us, right? Not uh, something which will create some havoc, right? So which will not uh, do something bad for the humanity, right? So, but yes, uh, raising your concerns, raising it in all the forums, right? Voicing, bringing your voice to the table is more important than ever because AI systems are taking decisions for us, right? It's more than important to understand what policies the government is placing, right? Should I also have? Do you think that you agree with that? Or do you have a viewpoint? Bringing them to the table is more important than ever, right? Whether you are a lawyer, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a layman, everybody has to bring in their viewpoint for the AI systems because it's getting bigger and bigger. <laughs> 